Hey everyone, here we are back in lab for lap number six, which as promised is our second muscular lab of the semester. Second and last muscular lab of the semester. So lab number five, that was a while ago, wasn't it? Your practical has already occurred and wasn't that fun. So all of that material in the first five labs, lab one, two, three, four, five, that's done. You will never see that again. Now we start fresh for the second half of the lab semester, which only has four labs in it, six, seven, eight, and nine, this one being first, number six. And as you have noticed already in your lab manual, this one is straightforward, a list of muscles and their functions that you have to know. So anatomical with physiology in the part of the functions, this requires drill and practice, drill and practice, drill and practice. So we have this, the instructional video, then the practice video, just like we had for lab number five, except this one is all muscles all the time. Notice this, what we would probably all agree, museum quality artwork here on the whiteboard showing us what? An arm. Essentially in anatomical position, just laterally extended like so. I had to label the thumb and the pinky with a T and a P because my drawing is so poor, you might not be able to tell otherwise. So what I've done is just drawn a section of human arm. Notice different colors for just one, two, three, four of the muscles found there. If you give me just a moment, I will show you one of my arm models that essentially corresponds to this picture right here. Now, I advise you to take this in small bites. Don't try to do everything at once. There's too much information, too many muscle functions for you. So here I just have four muscles drawn and labeled with wildly different colors. The biceps brachii, which you may have heard of before, remember use both words in the name here, biceps brachii, because we also have a biceps femoris in the thigh, the coracobrachialis, the triceps brachii, and the brachioradialis. Of course, if you are wise, you will be making your own diagrams of various body parts for all these muscles. But let's just look at this one, see what I did. Notice I wrote the name of the muscle and then circled in the same color the function or functions of that muscle. So in an arm like so, the topmost muscle that I would see in this view in the brachial region is the biceps brachii. Biceps brachii, flexion at the elbow, and shoulder supination. Flexion at the elbow, I bet most of you knew that, and shoulder supination. Supinating my shoulder. Flexion at the elbow, shoulder supination for the biceps brachii. And yes, I would recommend that you actually perform these functions when you look at the muscle that will help you learn it more quickly, we hope. Biceps brachii, flexion at the elbow, shoulder supination. Here it is right here. I will bring this closer. Let's hope the focus keeps up with me biceps brachii, right there. And in this view, what can I see just below it? A thin strap of muscle right there, just under the biceps brachii, that's the purple one, 
the coracobrachialis, responsible for adduction and flexion at the shoulder. Watch my shoulder. Adduction, flexion. The coracobrachialis assists in both of those actions. Adduction at the shoulder and shoulder flexion, coracobrachialis. I wonder what process of the scapula this thing attaches to. Hmm. Yes, you're an AP student. Good for you. Triceps brachii, I would see on the inferior part of the arm in this view, extension at the elbow. Triceps brachii right here on the bottom. It has two different heads that I can see in this view. This is all triceps brachii. Extension at the elbow. Remember, when somebody wants to try to work this particular muscle, the triceps brachii, don't they just do various versions of an elbow extension? These are all tricep exercises because they all involve extending your elbow. Triceps brachii. And then I see one, I tried to draw it here, I don't know how successful I was, that sweeps over the biceps brachii right at your elbow called the brachioradialis muscle. The brachioradialis muscle. This is a muscle that helps the biceps flex your elbow. Brachioradialis. So look at my model, and you will see these closer up. Biceps brachii, brachioradialis right there. Flexion at the elbow for the brachioradialis. I'm not trying to teach you these muscles right now. I'm trying to teach you a method where you can learn these muscles. So look at my picture. Look at my picture, and I suggest you make pictures similar to this as we go through these muscles in the instructional video. Yes, your textbook has beautiful diagrams of human musculature, but they label every single thing, not restricting themselves to only the list of muscles that we require of you. So just, again, a method that you might use Draw a few of them out, four or five at a time only. List their functions, maybe here on the back of a flashcard, something like that, and then drill and practice, learn these things. Okay, everybody, what are we looking at here other than fun with lab chairs? We're looking at the three primary models that I can use to show you these muscles in lab six. So if you count, there are, what, essentially 52 different muscles, counting connective tissue element and groupings of muscles that I can ask you from the muscular arm, muscular leg, and mini-me models, which I have here in this lab. The muscular leg will always be standing upright like this that we will see in lab, a very normal orientation. The muscular arm, I will not ask you questions with the muscular arm on its stand. This is not a normal position for an arm unless you constantly have a question that you want to ask me and I can't even call on you because I can't see you through the computer unless we're using Respondus Monitor. So the muscular arm, I will typically have out of its stand so we can rotate it and look at it a little more closely. The mini-me model will essentially be as it is right here, either anterior or posterior view, depending on the muscles that I want to show you. So here in the instructional video, I will take you through pointing at naming these muscles. I actually considered for this one only making a practice video because it's all memorization. But watch the instructional video. Maybe I can give you a few little pointers here and there and then do the practice video afterward. So let's begin with this 
muscular arm and I will show you some of the muscles from the first group that we can see on this model. Some of the muscles will require the full human figure to see. So follow along with me, page one. Let's name some of these muscles. So this arm, let me do a little camera work, you can see is palm down on the table like this, a right arm. I cannot see this first muscle in this view. I need a medial view of the arm. So I have to rotate it. Notice the scapula right here. And I can see two muscles very nicely right here in this medial view, the biceps brachii, right there, and this one under it, which is called the coracobrachialis. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. So looking straight up into somebody's axillary or armpit region here, I can see the biceps brachii muscle I use that as an anatomical landmark, this muscle, and I can see directly under it, but only on this medial view, the coracobrachialis, the first muscle in our list. Coraco from the coracoid process of the scapula, brachialis, right there. I don't see that much of it, but I can definitely see it. If I rotate this muscular arm back to its original position, I can see this triangular shaped muscle right here called the deltoid. Let me give you some different angles of it. This is the deltoid muscle right here, the second muscle that moves the arm the deltoid, the latissimus dorsi, and the pectoralis major muscles, I cannot see on this model. I would have to use the full human for that. I can only see a little piece of one of these muscles, not enough to ask you for a lab quiz. But the rotator cuff muscles, of which there are four, I can definitely see on this model. Rotator cuff is a collective name for four muscles that rotate your shoulder. Again, let me pivot this model here, looking again at the axillary region and you can see one of the rotator cuff muscles right here that lives on the underside of the scapula. In fact, it lives in that subscapular fossa. So look at your list of four muscle names. Which one do you think lives in the subscapular fossa? The subscapularis, which is this entire fan-shaped muscle right here, the subscapularis, one of the rotator cuff muscles. Let me just reorient this arm model so I can see the elbow here, the deltoid again, which I will remove now to see some of the other rotator cuff muscle. So we already named one, which, follow my finger everybody, is back here, that's the subscapularis, but we have three other rotator cuff muscles. I have one rather large muscle right here, see the three heads of it right here, that lives in the infraspinous fossa of my scapula. See the scapular spine? If it helps, I can do a rotation here 
So notice the spine of the scapula right here. This is the infraspinatus muscle that lives in the infraspinous fossa. Infraspinatus, right there. And if I look above the spine, right here, see this muscle that lives above the spine? The supraspinatus. It lives in the supraspinous fossa. So three out of my four rotator cuff muscles live in the fossas of the scapula. The infraspinatus, right here, supraspinatus, right there, and pivot. Notice when I can see the coracobrachialis, I can also see the subscapularis muscle. That's three out of my four rotator cuff muscles. The other one, often confused with the infraspinatus, is this small muscle right here. Notice how this one has a tendon it attaches over on this side and it has a partner that goes under the arm. These two are the teres muscles. Teres minor, teres major. The teres minor muscle, or teres, some people say, lives right next to the infraspinatus. It could be confused as a fourth head, believe it or not, but it has a slightly different origin so this is the teres minor, the fourth of the rotator cuff muscles. Teres minor, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and subscapularis, whoops, excuse me, these are the rotator cuff muscles. The teres major also moves your upper arm but it's not one of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff, they essentially occupy these fossas of the scapula. Infraspinatus, teres minor, supraspinatus, and the good old subscapularis. Those are the rotator cuff. Then we have the teres major right there. Let's look at some of these same muscles, plus the other two that I don't have on the arm using the mini-me model. So here's a pretty decent view of our mini-me. And we can hit all those muscles we just saw on our muscular arm, plus the others that are not on the muscular arm. So let's first look at the ones we have already seen. So I'm going to do an armectomy on this model to remove his arm. Notice right here the deltoid muscle. Very nice. And like on most good muscular models, I can remove it. And I have a quite excellent scapular spine right here, don't I? So I can see the supraspinatus muscle right here above the spine, the infraspinatus right here below the spine, teres minor right here. Remember, it looks like a fourth head of the infraspinatus, but it's a separate muscle. And then, whoosh, gotta, gotta have a sound effect, right? Whoosh, flip it over and I can see the subscapularis. Those four are the rotator cuff. When you study their actions, their functions, you might understand a little more about where the name comes from. So once again, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres, what? Minor, 
subscapularis, these are the rotator cuff. I can only see the subscapularis here at the same time I see this one. I know this isn't the practice video, but what's this one? The coracobrachialis, sure. Coracobrachialis and teres major. Teres major, teres minor, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, subscapularis, coracobrachialis, and wouldn't we love it if surgery was this easy? Look, I just replaced the deltoid. Deltoid muscle. So I've seen all of those. But what I couldn't see were these two that move the upper arm. The pectoralis major, yes, the big pecs, right there. Origin is the sternum, insertion is the humerus, the pecs. Right there, pectoralis major. And then if I rotate him around 180 degrees, I want you to look very closely here. I can see from lab five the trapezius muscle right here. Don't look at that. Look below it right here. These fibers right here. This is the latissimus dorsi muscle. The latissimus dorsi muscle. Do some pull-ups or pull down. Sometimes at the gym they call these lat pull-downs, pulling that big bar down. So latissimus dorsi, I only see it on one side because remember this other side on the model's left, they removed that so I could see the erector spinae group from back in lab number five. So latissimus dorsi and pectoralis major muscles can only be seen on this model. These are the muscles that move the arm. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play today. Put. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Is this mic live right now? Oh, man. I guess I'll have to edit that out because what kind of fool would I be if I didn't? What I'm doing now is pausing to take just a moment to talk a little more about these rotator cuff muscles. So you see I've dotted them here. We have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. These are the rotator cuff. Teres major, not officially part of the group, sometimes gets, you know, a little honorable mention nod in there, causing medial rotation. But these four muscles grouped together, we see this with the hamstrings, the quadriceps, some other groups of muscles, they're typically grouped together either for anatomical or physiological reasons. Here, it's physiological, the rotator cuff. Now, why did I sneak up to my office and bring down one of my softballs? As some of you from my lectures may know, I did spend some time coaching and a lot of time playing the actual real bat and ball game, which everyone knows is fast pitch softball. Not baseball, tiny little ball, great big bat, so much time between plays, lots of time for scratching yourself, chewing tobacco spitting, things like that. that's baseball. And I kid the baseball players, of course. But really, it's fast pitch softball. Now, this fast pitch softball that I brought down, you may notice, if you can see close enough, actually has cell organelles painted on it. I can see mitochondria, I can see the nucleus, the nucleolus, I can see some rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, even a Golgi apparatus. What? You don't have a softball with cell organelles painted on it? Maybe it's just me? This happens to be one that was made for me 
way back when, many years ago, by one of my ball players who played second base. And this was the cell project for sophomore year in high school, had to make a cell. This one's a cell painted on a softball. Everybody should have one. The reason I snuck up to my office and brought it down is to describe the common injuries we see to this muscle group. Maybe it will help you remember some of the functions here. Because these four muscles, along with the teres major, largely responsible for rotational motion at the shoulder. Medial rotation, the Teres major does some of that, as does the subscapularis. Lateral rotation, the infraspinatus and teres minor doing that one. And the supraspinatus, which is in this group, doesn't specifically cause rotational motion at the shoulder, but it does hold the head of the humerus in place in this rather crappy ball in socket joint we call the shoulder. Constant overuse injuries people get with these muscles. And I don't just mean ball players or weekend warriors, people in everyday life. I've got a little bit of a messed up rotator cuff here and I'm not left handed. This actually from moving my son around when he was much younger. He was a rather big burly infant and you can damage these muscles fairly easily some people quite seriously these rotational motions at the shoulder if you think about a person pitching a baseball throwing what's called a curve ball or a slider or this actually a word in baseball a slurve halfway between a slider and a curveball. But I won't get on them too much. If I can make up a word like acromioclavicular, I suppose I can let the baseball world get by with slurve. These pitches involve lateral rotation at the shoulder. The dreaded screwball, medial rotation. And these motions over and over again can cause rather serious overuse injuries, tendonitis, and so on to these muscles. And if you imagine somebody at a high level throwing a pitch like that as hard as they possibly can many, many times, that can cause serious damage to these muscles. Lots of people have rotator cuff injuries. This group of muscles causing medial and lateral rotation at the shoulder. Why do we not see this so much in softball? Well, softball is a circumduction, the windmill pitch. I'm not saying that a softball pitcher cannot throw a curveball. It would have to be a very, very skilled pitcher. I've seen it before. I stood right behind a home plate and watched a starting Division I NCAA softball pitcher from the University of Iowa throw a curveball and it curved substantially. But that's a little bit rare and that has to be done underhand, not overhand like in baseball. This is the reason that a long baseball pitching career typically involves people not throwing these pitches or junk on the ball until much later. When we start out young people, adolescents, pre-adolescents, throwing very hard rotational balls like this over and over again, that typically isn't going to work very long and last too long for many people. A lot of people who have successful baseball careers into college and beyond don't start doing these things until much later than the youth league baseball that you see. Sorry to burst any bubbles for the baseball people, but this anatomist's general advice is don't start throwing junk until much later. Not to turn this into a coaching clinic, but the next time we meet here at Ball Game Central, maybe we can explain the infield fly rule, or I can tell you why 
a 1-3-2 double play is the best one going. Next, we will go into the second group of muscles in your lab manual, muscles that move the forearm and the hand. So these are typically muscles that we see mostly in the brachial region right here and the proximal region of the forearm. Now what you can see is I'm showing you a lateral view of this arm right there and we can see the first muscles here I like to call the three B's. In order as you see them, we have the biceps brachii muscle right here on top, the brachialis muscle right here beneath it, and sweeping across the forearm, sweeping across the elbow, we have what's called the brachioradialis muscle. So, biceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis, three B's. And these are the muscles that bend the elbow. So all three of these muscles cause flexion at the elbow. So we have the biceps brachii, the brachialis, brachioradialis. A way to maybe remember this, if I remove the deltoid muscle from this model, we can see a little better the biceps brachii and brachialis right here. These two muscles visible here on the lateral view. But if I flip this arm all the way around, so we're once again looking at the armpit, you can see the biceps brachii and smaller coracobrachialis right here. So the coracobrachialis visible only on the armpit or axillary side, the brachialis only visible on the outside or the lateral view. Biceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis. Now, I do want to make one correction in the function that you see in your lab manual, and I will insert a graphic about this one as well. Just a small typo. When you look at page three, and you see the functions of the muscles, for biceps brachii, we have flexion at the elbow, which is true for all three of my Bs, and forearm supination, not shoulder supination. We don't actually supinate our shoulder. So the official functions for you on your quiz, on your practical, for the biceps brachii, the gun show, the biceps brachii is flexion at the elbow and forearm supination. Brachialis and brachioradialis flex the elbow, flexion of the elbow. And remember, do some of these functions as you think about these muscles. So if we consider the biceps brachii flexion at the elbow, brachialis flexion at the elbow, brachioradialis flexion at the elbow, and the biceps brachii assists in supination of the forearm, which we will see in just a minute. So the other muscles in this group, moving the forearm in the hand, are the pronator teres, the supinator, and the triceps brachii. So let's take a quick look at those on this very same arm model. Let me reposition for a slightly better view. So I want you to notice this view of the arm. I can see the biceps brachii sweeping down right here, brachioradialis right there. This is the front or the anterior side of the elbow. 
and I can see, compared to the others, a relatively small muscle right here that has an origin back here, an insertion over here, and guess what it does? It pronates the forearm. Pronation turns the palm down. Palm down is pronation. So this muscle lives right here. In fact, if I press with my fingers and I perform pronation, I can actually feel this muscle contract when I do this. This is the pronator teres, which causes pronation, see the model's hand, of the forearm. Pronation, pronator teres, right here under my thumb, the pronator teres. The supinator is the partner to this muscle, but important point here for you to remember, looking at these models, I can only see the supinator muscle if I first remove the brachioradialis. There it is, it's completely gone. Now I want you to look close, and I'll zoom in a little bit. If you can see the fiber orientation of the pronator teres right here, and its antagonist right here, the supinator. So again, I can only see this muscle right here, the supinator, if I first remove the brachioradialis muscle. The pronator teres pronates the forearm. The supinator supinates the forearm. So supinator and pronator teres on either side of the elbow. The pronator is on the medial side. The supinator is on the lateral side. You'll see a bunch of views of this not only on our other model over here, but in the lab practice section as well. The last muscle in this group for us is the triceps brachii, which I can see at least two of the heads right here. It's a three-headed muscle, meaning three origins, triceps brachii. This is the primary antagonist of my three B's, the biceps brachii and brachialis, which flex the elbow, the triceps brachii extends the elbow. So the triceps brachii, if I stand the arm up a little bit here, so again this is a lateral view, see the biceps brachii, whoops, I just lost the lateral head of the triceps. All right, if we look at the muscles standing upright a little bit here, so see the hand, we have the biceps brachii and brachialis, again, lateral view, brachioradialis right there under my finger, and then this mass of muscle right here on the back side of the upper arm is the triceps brachii, a lateral long end medial head, but you don't have to know those three. You just have to know triceps brachii on the back end. The primary function of the triceps brachii is elbow extension. Elbow extension. Now let's look at them on the smaller mini me model. Let's focus our attention on this model. So we're looking at the upper arm, lateral side, Usually best if I remove this deltoid muscle for us to see some of these things. And I can see quite nicely here the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and brachioradialis. Remember the brachioradialis sweeps across 
the front side of the elbow. I can see the triceps brachii right here. Now, not to get all lectury on you here, but what bone exists right here where my probe is? Well, the humerus. And the biceps brachii and brachialis are on the anterior side of the bone, triceps brachii on the posterior side, and the big key is where are the insertions of these muscles on the anterior and posterior sides of the forearm. So, the triceps brachii, which inserts back here on the olecranon, causes elbow extension. It pulls on that olecranon, causing extension of the elbow. The B's insert on the radius and cause elbow flexion. In fact, if I press my fingers right here into my antecubital space, I can feel tendons tightening in there when I put on the gun show, contracting the biceps brachii and brachialis muscles. Biceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis, and triceps brachii right back here. And if I remove the arm from the model completely, I will wager that we'll see in the elbow, look closely, so this is the brachioradialis muscle. Who's this little thing right here? Notice the palm. On the palm side, I have the pronator teres causing pronation of the forearm. Can I see the supinator? Well, the correct answer is no, not unless I first remove the brachioradialis and then I can see the supinator right there. Look for it to live under this model's version of a nerve here. Pronator teres, supinator. Pronator teres on the medial side, supinator on the lateral side. Look for these. Now we're down at the bottom of page one in your lab manual, looking at those muscles that move the hand and the fingers. And essentially what we have are flexors and extensors largely doing action at about the wrist and to some of the fingers. So the view we have of our muscular arm right here is like so. And we can have of our wrist flexion right there or extension right there. We can also have abduction at the wrist toward the side of the radius. Remember how we would stand in anatomical position. Abduction and adduction as well at the wrist. So flexion, extension. And if we think about flexion, what muscles, where would they be, could cause this type of motion to happen? Well, these would have to be muscles on the palm side. They would pull. Remember, muscles pull things. So they would pull my wrist and my hand in this direction. So this is where my flexors are. On the other side, that's where my extensors would be located. So if we're looking at this model, I expect to see flexors over here on the palm side and extensors back here on the back side or the posterior side, the side with the back of your hand. So flexors live here. In fact, you can see some of these flexor tendons right there. And the extensors are on the back side of the forearm. And we start with the two 
extensor muscles that you must know. So let me rotate the arm over to this position so that we can see both of them and they are not hard to identify at all if you just remember one trick. Look at the second extensor muscle, the extensor digitorum. The extensor digitorum. Follow my finger down and see these three tendons on the back side of the hand. If I make a claw, I can actually see tendons right here. And these are the tendons of the extensor digitorum muscle. Digit fingers, extensor, it extends your fingers. So if I follow these three back, trace my finger with me, this muscle right here that's continuous with those tendons is the extensor digitorum muscle. One of my two extensors for this lab. The other one is called the extensor carpi ulnaris. I'm going to say that name again, the ECU. One of my personal favorites. In fact, there's a published picture out there in the world that I have drawn of some of these forearm muscles. Can you believe it or not? I'm a published artist and you people have seen some of my pictures, but yes, it's out there. The, and, and it's not good. I'm, I'm just saying that, it's not very good, but it is out there. The extensor digitorum lives right next door to the ECU, the extensor carpi ulnaris. If I look at this hand, I can see the thumb and the pinky which side is my ulna on? Pinky side. So once I know the extensor digitorum right here under my finger, the only other extensor, the only other muscle on this side that I get to ask you is this one right here the extensor carpi ulnaris. Extensor, it's on this side. It's an extensor muscle. Carpi goes to the wrist. Ulnaris on the side where the ulna lives. Extensor carpi ulnaris muscle. Extensor digitorum muscle. These are the only two on this side that I get to ask you and only one of them is connected to these phalanx or finger digits or tendons. So extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris. In fact, I had a late uncle who was in the Navy and he actually had a tattoo of a hula girl on his forearm and when he would drum his fingers like this, wiggling these muscles around, she would appear to dance. I'm sure he's not the only service member who ever did that. He had a stint in the Navy and then 20 some years in the Army. But we as kids always made him do this so we could watch the girl on his forearm dance. That's these muscles right back here. Extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris. I can see the same exact thing on the Minimi's forearm, what do I use as my anatomical landmark, everyone? The tendons to these three digits. Digit two, three, and four, if we were counting them appropriately, index, middle, and ring fingers. Follow them back, and where do we go? Right to this thing, which is the extensor digitorum. And right next to it over here, these are superficial muscles here, this is the extensor carpi ulnaris. Now, how would I know this one from this other labeled one here? 
it doesn't matter. You don't have to. You just know two on this side, right? Once you know the extensor digitorum, the only other one I can ask you is right here, the extensor carpi ulnaris. So use this anatomical landmark for those extensor muscles. Now let's talk about the flexors, which means I need to, what, what am I doing here, people? Pronating or supinating the forearm. I'm supinating, right? Palm up. So here I have four labeled muscles. We'll start with the first three, the easier three. The palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis. On this side of the forearm. The palmaris is by far the easiest one to identify, no question. <coughs> Excuse me, sneezing, I will have to edit that out. Why do I say the palmaris longus is so easy to identify? Well, look at its tendon and how it ends. Let me do a little camera work for you here. And I want you to look at the ending of this tendon right there that I'm tapping. This muscle has a tendon that ends right on this piece of connective tissue called the palmar aponeurosis, which I don't believe is on your list of things to know, but it's just a good handy anatomical landmark for us to use. Once I know the palmaris longus, which I can recognize by its tendon, then the other two superficial flexors get pretty easy. Because I'm hoping you can tell which side is the thumb side, which side is the pinky side in this view right here. There's thumbkin, there's pinky. The pinky side is where the ulna lives, thumb side where the radius lives. The palmaris longus is in the middle. Everyone, let me say that again. The palmaris longus muscle is the one found in the middle of these other two flexors. This muscle right here, let me zoom out a little for us. This muscle right here is on the thumb or radius side from the palmaris longus. This is the flexor, flexus, carpi, wrist, radialis. The FCR, the flexor carpi radialis muscle right here. Again, palmaris longus right there. The third of these three superficial flexors, I need to rotate a little bit. It's the one on the other side, the ulna side from the palmaris longus. Notice this muscle right here, flexor carpi ulnaris, that runs all the way down here as a tendon on See which side it's on? It's still on the flexor side, the anterior side. This is the flexor carpi radi or ulnaris. This is the flexor carpi ulnaris, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi radialis. Remember, palmaris longus in the middle sandwiched on either side by the flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris. Then we have one deep flexor muscle, but it actually has superficialis in its name. Believe it or not, kind of strange, I will be the first to admit. So notice what I'm doing here. Taking off my pronator teres, taking off my flexor carpi radialis and 
palmaris longus, at least the bellies of these muscles. And I see this big sheet of muscle right here. Again, a little anatomical trick. Notice I have to, model-wise, dissect this away so we can see these fibers, which are fibers of the flexor digitorum superficialis. This muscle runs all the way down the forearm, dips under the palmar aponeurosis, and ends in these tendons you see right here in the palm of the hand, causing flexion of the fingers. Now, it's a little, I guess I would say the word is counterintuitive, that this muscle is deep to the wrist flexors, but it's the most superficial of the digital flexors. So its name is the flexor digitorum superficialis because it's the uppermost, topmost, superficial most of the digital flexors. So let me put this back on and just one more quick rundown on the flexor side. I always locate the palmaris longus first. Palmaris longus. Flexor carpi what? Radialis. A little pivoting here. This could only be, on the other side of the palmaris longus, the flexor carpi ulnaris. Now let's look at the mini-me's forearm, the other side. Again, what are we looking at? flexors. So first, can you see the palmaris longus muscle? Look right here at the palmar aponeurosis. There it is. Palmaris longus. Then there's only two others I can ask you, remember, in this view. Flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris. How about this muscle? Does it have a name? Yes. We don't care what it is. Palmaris longus, flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris. Way over here on that ulna side. And then, if I remove this, what can I see deep to those muscles? The muscle fibers of the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. Think about those and how you have to see them when you do the practice video. What we're looking at here is, of course, a thigh on one of my muscular leg models. And you can probably see behind us here, we have a whole bunch of beautiful leg models back there, but they're all the same. They're actually all even the left ones. So there's no difference in any of these. And we're gonna look at muscles up here. First, if we notice in our lab manual, these are muscles that move the thigh. Remember, the thigh is the area from your hip to your knee. Your leg is your knee to your ankle. So we're gonna talk about muscles that move the thigh, then we're gonna talk about muscles that move the leg, then we have muscles that move the feet and the toes. So let's start up here with some of the more obvious muscles that I see in this anterior view that are from the first group. So have your lab manual handy, and I want you looking at my muscle model. And let's start with a few of the obvious ones. The two that we can see here very obviously are the iliacus and the psoas major muscle. The iliacus 
and the psoas major. So notice the iliac crest that I see right here. And in the iliac fossa, I have the iliacus muscle right here. This is the iliacus. And then appearing to shoot right up out of it, a separate muscle, the silent P, psoas major muscle right here. So I want you to look at these two, the iliacus and the psoas major. Psoas major, iliacus, sometimes considered to be one muscle by anatomists and they will, of course, put the two words together. They pronounce the P oftentimes when we do this and somebody might say the iliopsoas. For our purposes, for our lab, your quiz, your test, your practical, psoas major, iliacus, two separate muscles. The only way to see them, of course, is when all this internal stuff is removed. So you have to look for that iliac crest, iliacus, psoas major. If I turn this thing around and let me double check my camera angle, it's pretty good. I can see the gluteus maximus, the glute, and the gluteus medius right here. Maximus, of course, is the larger one. It can be removed pretty easily on most of these models, not on most people, of course. And think of these two with regard to intramuscular injections. Some of you will actually be giving these. Some of you already give these. When I go in to get a COVID vaccine, somebody typically just looks at the triangle that is my deltoid muscle and they stick a needle in the middle of the thing. The gluteal injections, a ventrogluteal injection typically is of the gluteus medius, a dorsal gluteal injection, gluteus maximus. Medius is typically preferred, a little less painful, you're not sitting on it, less likely to strike a big blood vessel. This is the one where you'll see somebody use their fingers. They'll go to the anterior superior spine and the top of the iliac crest and they make a triangle and then they jab you with a needle in the middle of the triangle. Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius. As I rotate this muscle around again so we can see the front side of it, now we see some superficial muscles that still move the thigh, one of which right here is called the tensor fascia or fascia latte muscle. The tensor of the lateral fascia. Some people and I'm talking to you, some of you people, in the future you will call this great big sheet of tendon the iliotibial band. This big sheet. This muscle, amongst other things that it does, it tenses this iliotibial band or the lateral, lateral side, pinky toe side, fascia or fascia that I see here. Tensor fascia Latte. I wonder if there's a memory trick that could help us learn this one. Mm. Okay, everyone, what are we looking at? Well, of course, a close-up on that little pocket found in blue jeans. Now, I would have shown you this in lab, but I was not wearing a pair of pants that had this little pocket. You know the one I'm talking about, this thing right here. Everybody wonders what it's for in blue jeans. Most likely, it was for a pocket watch back at a time when people wore pocket watches. And this considered all-American garment, even though it's named for Genoa in Italy and made from a fabric named after a city in France, and of course created most popularly by 
a Bavarian immigrant named Levi Strauss. But these pants that we have, blue jeans, have this little pocket right here. And this little pocket sits right on top of the tensor fascia latte muscle. So what I want you to imagine is a time when you could go to a coffee shop with your friends. There were no problems and no restrictions, that sort of thing. Maybe we'll get there after the vaccines and everything. But I want you to imagine that you have change in this pocket, coins in that pocket, and you go to the coffee shop with your friend to buy what? A latte. And you reach into this pocket and pull the coins out to buy a latte. So this is your tensor fascia latte pocket. Tensor fascia latte pocket. That's right where this pocket sits, is right directly on top of that muscle. Just a little memory trick to hopefully help you with this muscle's name. And yes, during lab, I typically would wear a pair of blue jeans and reach into this pocket and pull a quarter out. Not that you could buy a cup of coffee for a quarter anymore, but, but I, think I think you, you get, get the, the idea. idea. Tensor, Tensor fascia, fascia latte, latte pocket. Okay, now we're back. Let's rotate around to the medial side of this thigh right here. And I'm going to take off the tensor fascia latte muscle. I'm going to take off this one we haven't done yet called the sartorius. And then I'm going to zoom in a little bit for you. Just a little. And we're going to see some muscles here that are adductors of the hip. Adductors, pulling the hip in, pulling the femur in toward the midline. So notice where I'm tapping my probe right now, this is the pubic bone. Can be easily palpated in people. And I want you to notice right here Shooting off the pubic bone, I have a very small muscle right there called the pectineus. Find it in your list under muscles that move the thigh. The pectineus muscle right there. And as I turn it ever so slightly, I see a second, much larger muscle here, also connected to the pubic bone. This one is the adductor longus muscle. I'm going to say that again. The adductor longus muscle. Keep rotating. I see this superficial strap of muscle right here coming off the pubic bone. This one is the gracilis muscle, the gracilis muscle. Keep rotating. And then I see one last one coming off back here. This one is called the adductor magnus muscle, the adductor magnus. All four of these muscles create the motion of adduction at the hip, the pectineus, adductor longus, gracilis, adductor magnus. Now I do this the same way every single time I go through these four hip adductors. Pectineus, Adductor longus, gracilis, adductor magnus. Pectineus, longus, gracilis, magnus. Pectineus, longus, gracilis, magnus. I say them in that order of four the same way each time. Why do I do that? So then I don't care where the dot is. 
I just start with the first one and recite my four muscles in order. So say it along with me one time slowly, starting right here at the pubic bone, pectineus, adductor longus, gracilis, adductor magnus. The gracilis is the very superficial one on this medial side of the thigh. Magnus is actually quite big. Most of it's covered up. The longest, of course, quite long, going all the way down here, but pectineus, this little short one. Pectineus, longus, gracilis, magnus. Pectineus, longus, gracilis, magnus. I do that every single time to keep them straight in order. Make sure you're learning the functions. These are muscles that what? Move the thigh. Each one has an individual function. Let me put back on my sartorius and my tensor fascia latte muscle. Now let's take a look at some of these muscles that we say move the leg muscles that act upon the tibia down here. So we're going to start here in the anterior compartment, the front of the thigh, naming some of these muscles. So first off, I have the group of four quadriceps muscles, the quads that live right here on the anterior surface of your thigh. This long muscle, we'll get to, the sartorius, is not one of the four quadriceps. The quadriceps live right here. I can see three of them very, very nicely here. Look at your lab manual, follow along with me. This big one in the center, this big one in the center, the rectus femoris muscle. Rectus femoris. Now I want you to notice the iliac crest here and the tensor fascia latte, which tells me this is the lateral side. That's my anatomical landmark. This muscle that I see here is the vastus lateralis straight down from the tensor. Everybody see that? Vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, and then what do you suppose this one is right here? Vastus medialis muscle. The vastus medialis muscle. Let me adjust my camera just a little bit for us. And I can go through those again. Vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, vastus medialis. Three out of the four quads or quadriceps in, again, this anterior compartment of the thigh. Now, these four muscles are primarily knee extensors, extensors of your knee. They all converge into that patellar tendon that attaches on your tibial tuberosity. You know that thing somebody whacks you with a hammer on? Let's go a little lower. So they hit you with a hammer right here to get the knee-jerk reflex hitting the tendon. Some people call it a ligament here, but the tendon that's continuous with these four muscles. And you say, wait a minute, Dwayne. You've only shown us three of those muscles. Yet you say there are four. Yes, there are four of them. So again, with what we know here, Rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, 
vastus medialis. Where's the fourth one? You see in the list, the vastus intermedius. Well, to see that one, the rectus femoris must be removed. I can see the fibers right up here in the middle. The vastus intermedius muscle. So now I can see the three vastus muscles, lateralis, intermedius, medialis. Three out of the four quadriceps but I can't see all four of them at the same time in this model. I can only see three at a time. The three vastus or two vastus and the rectus femoris. The quadriceps, primary extensors of the knee. And again, use the iliac crest and the tensor fascia latte as your frames of reference for the lateral side. Let me spin this leg around so we can look at the back of the thigh and see the hamstrings in the posterior compartment. The hamstrings. Let me get to what's a, a pretty perfect view right there. Now, you will notice a big split in this group of three muscles. The three muscles are the biceps femoris, I can see over here, the semitendinosus right here, and the semimembranosus right there. I don't know if you can see this cleavage, this division between these two muscles. We'll look at it a little closer in a moment. The biceps femoris, notice the gluteus maximus, is on the lateral side. Biceps femoris on the lateral side, right here. The two semi-muscles, semitendinosus and semimembranosus, they sort of live one on top of the other on the medial side. The semitendinosus with the T is the one you see right here on the top as I look at it. Semitendinosus T for top. The semimembranosus, which is actually wider, I can see it both places where my fingers run. The semimembranosus is the most medial muscle of the three. See it over here with all the M's in it, semimembranosus. So semitendinosus on the top, semimembranosus, most medial. These three muscles together make up the group we call the hamstrings, which are the knee flexors, bringing the heel toward the rear end. The hamstrings. Now, I grew up in a family of meat packers. This is not weird to me. But when you eat a ham, what are you eating? Hamstrings. When you buy an expensive ham that has a bone in the middle of it, what's the bone? Femur. So when you get a big, nice, chunk of ham, you're looking at hamstrings, quadriceps, maybe some of these medial adductors, they don't discriminate that much, but this, this is the same root word, so hamstrings, ham right here. People oftentimes can easily pull one of these or strain one of these muscles because they don't exercise them very much, the knee flexors, the hamstrings, biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, right there. But we're not done with our muscles of the thigh that move the leg. We still have one left, and that's this sartorius muscle. 
I didn't save it for last in this group for any particular reason, but it does show up last. This is that long, strappy muscle that, like many of our skeletal muscles, actually crosses two joints, the hip and the knee. That's not that unusual to have a two-joint muscle as you study them. But the sartorius, in most people, is the longest muscle they have. In most people, the sartorius is the longest muscle of the body. This one extends a little more than 40 centimeters, which is a pretty good length. But it's not as long as the one I have, everyone. If we look at this leg right here, it is not as long as my leg is. This leg is a good few inches shorter than my leg, and this sartorius muscle is 40 centimeters long. In many people, it can be 50 centimeters long or more. So in most humans, this is the longest muscle they have containing the longest individual muscle fibers, maybe 50 to 60 centimeters which is nothing to sneeze at. Here's 50 centimeters right there. So that's pretty long for a cell, not our longest cell, that's the neurons. This sartorius muscle gets its name from the root word meaning tailor. This sartorius muscle is sometimes called the tailor muscle because it allows a person to sit tailor style. Which is this cross-legged style of sitting. The sartorius muscle flexes the hip, flexes the knee, and laterally rotates the hip like so. Imagine somebody with no chair working on clothes or fabric, so they drape the fabric this way and go to work. The tailor muscle. So my sartorius muscle allows me to create this motion right here. Okay, now let's look at some of these same muscles acting on the thigh and the leg on this mini-me model. Once you've seen them on the larger leg model, which is sitting right over there, it should be quite a bit easier with, let's say, maybe two exceptions that are sort of tough to see on the mini-me. But let's take a look at these muscles right now. In an effort to give you about the best video image that I can, I've zoomed in a little bit here on the mini-me model. And let's just take a look at some of these muscles that we've already seen and let's review the names. So what's the name of this muscle right here from which I might grab some change out of that little pocket in my pants? Yes, the tensor fascia or fascia latte muscle. On the anterior side, right under that, you know, hip pocket. I guess I would say, on the anterior side. Then I see the quadriceps group right here with the one, two vastus muscles that are always obvious to see. So use this tensor muscle as a frame of reference because this is latte, lateral. So this one is the vastus lateralis. That makes this one the vastus medialis. And which muscle lives right between those two in the quadriceps group? The rectus femoris. Vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, vastus medialis. Now where, question mark, where is the vastus intermedius? can only be seen deep. It's down here. I would have to first remove this long band of muscle 
which by the way what's this one called right here that is the sartorius muscle the sartorius so if I remove it like so and if I remove the rectus femoris like so you can probably even see what the model builder did they numbered this one right here much smaller than its two siblings is the vastus intermedius muscle so vastus medialis vastus intermedius vastus lateralis muscles that I can see on the anterior side of the thigh. Now, if I rotate this model a little bit and try to do a little bit of camera work for you, I think you can see the little tiny pectineus right here. Now, remember my method from the larger leg model how I go through these muscles mentally every time. Pectineus, adductor longus, gracilis, adductor magnus. So first, right here, the most difficult to see, I think, of them on this model is the pectineus. That makes this one the adductor longus and sort of difficult to see just because of the positioning of the legs and the fact that this model does not disassemble. Its legs do not come apart from the rest of it. So again, I can see the pectineus, abductor longus, and right here, riding on top, see that? This is the gracilis muscle. This is the best view I get of that one on this model. And if I spin the whole thing around, get ready for a chalk-like squeak here. If I spin this model around a little bit, I can see right here the adductor magnus. Adductor magnus. So remember, from anterior to posterior, pectineus, adductor longus, gracilis, adductor magnus, that's this one right here on this model. And if I continue to rotate this model and zoom out just a little bit with our camera, I can see obviously back here the gluteus maximus, a little hint, not that well represented, gluteus medius right here, but once I see the old glute, I know this is the lateral side on the back. If the other leg didn't clue you in that this was medial, that makes this lateral. That allows me to identify the three muscles here in the hamstrings group. The hemis, if you will. And remember, there are three muscles in this group. On the lateral side, I have this one, the biceps femoris muscle. Then moving in a medial direction, I have the semitendinosus right here. And I think, at least it appears to me, I can see this. You can see the division between the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus right here. Look for this division. And I'll let my probe hang out here for a moment so maybe it'll focus in nicely for you. This division right here separates the semitendinosus from the semimembranosus. The membranosus is not that visible because it's covered up largely by this semitendinosus muscle right here. Again, those three muscles are what? The hamstrings. Now, if I rotate this model around again, so brace your ears or mute it for a second. 
you will notice that if I take off the chest plate, to get this model to fall completely apart, or at least muscular speaking, as far apart as I can get it, and I remove some of the innards, I do all this, I can see the iliacus muscle right there. I can see the iliacus muscle right here. Notice that iliac crest you can see. And then probably just my personal opinion about as crappy a psoas major here and here as you ever wanted to see. The iliacus, however, is not too bad. Here it is again on this other side. Iliacus, because it lives in the iliac fossa, right under the iliac crest. The psoas major doesn't particularly look good on this model, but you can see it. So make sure you're going through these muscles in the practice section, both the name and all functions listed in the lab manual. As I've told you many times, I suggest maybe you draw some of these muscles out before you work really hard on memorizing them. It tends to make it go a little faster for you. Okay, what the heck is Professor Allner doing standing on the table? Well, let me take a quick look around and I'll ask, does anybody here object to me standing on the table? No? Okay, I didn't think so. It's unanimous. I can stand on the table today. What we're looking at in our last group of muscles are those that act on the ankle and the foot. So these would be muscles found in the leg. Remember, leg is between your knee and your ankle that act on the ankle and the foot, primarily causing what? Dorsiflexion dorsiflexion of the ankle, plantar flexion at the angle, and inversion and eversion at the ankle. Dorsiflexion, muscles in the front. Plantar flexion, muscles in the back. Eversion, muscles on the side. Inversion, you would think, muscles on the medial side. But look at this, we don't have much in the way of muscles on the medial side of the human leg. What we have are muscles in the anterior compartment, the lateral compartment and the posterior compartment. So we'll go through these in turn, but remember these muscles primarily causing dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, and eversion at the ankle. Now, if the table behind my leg looks wet, that's only because I just cleaned the thing, because if you stand on the table, you should probably clean the table. So let's look at this leg model. And now we're looking at these muscles. Muscles that are in the anterior compartment between the tibia and the fibula. Muscles that are in the lateral compartment riding above the fibula or superficial too, and muscles in the posterior compartment behind the tibia and fibula. And look at the medial compartment, there really isn't one. Go ahead and knock on your own 
medial compartment with your hand, I'm doing it right now on mine, and you just hit this bone right here, which of course is the tibia. But don't hit too hard because remember, you have a periosteum there. So let's look at this model. Now, you always need to orient yourself. The knee, the big toe, would be very good things to use for that orientation here in the two-dimensional space that we have in an online lab. You do not have the option of handling this model, of rotating it yourself. It's all dependent from your point of view on whatever images I provide. So let's start here in what's called the anterior compartment of the leg with this muscle right here, the tibialis anterior. Notice it rides directly above your big toe and it lives right next to the tibia. The tibialis anterior. Let me do hopefully a tiny bit of camera work to perhaps make it a little more obvious for you. But I still want to be able to see the knee and the big toe. There we go. Tibialis anterior. Some people confuse it with this muscle, which is the extensor digitorum of your leg, which is not on our list. So the only muscle I can ask you on the front side or anterior surface, again, notice the patella and the big toe, is this one, the tibialis anterior muscle. If I rotate this model around to the side, so now I'm looking at the lateral compartment right here. The most superficial muscle I see right here, this one, is the fibularis longus muscle. The fibularis longus on the outside of your leg. This muscle right here, actually very pronounced, typically very large in people who are active bicyclists, bike riders. Now, I don't know if you've been in the market for a bike since the pandemic started, but good luck finding a good one right now because they're fairly scarce. But if you have a bicycle and you ride it, particularly a bicycle where your foot clips into a pedal, Every time you do an upstroke, you have an e-version of your foot to help power your pedal, and that really works this muscle right here, the fibularis longus muscle. Just like the tibialis anterior, the fibularis longus is the only one I can ask you in this lateral compartment. Now, if I rotate this just a little bit, I can see two of the three muscles we have in the posterior compartment. These two muscles are in order the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle. Gastrocnemius and soleus muscle. The gastrocnemius, or calf muscle, is more superficial. The soleus is under it. I can always see them like this. If I rotate it more so you can see the backside, this calf muscle, two heads. This one, like many of our human muscles, is a two-joint muscle, so it has actions that reflect that. It crosses two joints gastrocnemius, and then very obviously right here, the soleus. Now, I always tell people, 
a potential way to remember this soleus muscle, if I remove this thing, this is the soleus muscle that we see right here. And to me, it does look somewhat like a fish fillet for those, you know, culinary people in the audience today. And sole is a name of a fish. So the soleus muscle, this one that looks sort of like a fish, under the calf muscle or the gastrocnemius. Now, if I put this back on, like so, I can see that these two muscles in the posterior compartment, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, which cause plantar flexion of the ankle by pulling up on the calcaneus bone, right there. And these two muscles, like the quadriceps, have a common tendon that's right here, the calcaneal tendon, the only connective tissue element in this week's lab. This is the calcaneal tendon, sometimes called the Achilles tendon. For those of you who love Greek mythology, of course, when Achilles' mother dunked him in the river to make him invulnerable, she had to hold him somewhere, she held him right here, so then that part of his body did not get submerged, so then that was his weak spot, his Achilles heel. There you get it? The Achilles tendon, but the technical name is the calcaneal tendon, and I have no idea if Achilles looked like Brad Pitt or not. But the calcaneal tendon, the tendon of the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles. So now, now let's be very careful on the posterior side in this posterior compartment of the leg. So the two muscles that are pretty easy, I think, to find, the gastrocnemius and the soleus because they're continuous with this calcaneal tendon. The third and final muscle in our list is the tibialis posterior. So if I remove what we commonly call the calf, the gastrocnemius and soleus, I will be able to see just a part of that tibialis posterior. Remember, this is the tibialis anterior and if I rotate this around, you might think that this one is the tibialis posterior. No, 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 no. This is the flexor digitorum of your leg, which is not in our list for lab number six. Nor is this one. This is a popliteal muscle, the popliteus, many people call it. What we have to do is look down inside, behind the knee, and I can see just a hint of the tibialis posterior right here. It's a deep muscle of the posterior compartment. How can I use that to help me out on a lab quiz or a practical? Well, again, keep this in mind in a very practical, yes, I did just say that, sense. On the back side, there's only three muscles that I can ask you. Gastrocnemius, soleus, then any other muscle back here on the heel side. When these are removed, would be the tibialis posterior, right there. So it's on the posterior side of your leg, but I can only see a small amount of it here, but it's the only one that's deep back here. So there's only three in this posterior compartment two of which are removed 
So by process of elimination, this one would have to be the tibialis posterior. Again, you want to use the knee, front or back, ankle, big toe, as your points of reference anatomically down here in the leg. Now let's go over these same muscles on the mini-me model. So here's the leg on the mini-me. Remember, we want to use the knee, the big toe, the heel. These are points of reference for us. And, of course, I can see this shaft of the tibia, which helps too. So in the anterior compartment, I can see the tibialis anterior muscle right there. In the lateral compartment, the fibularis longus muscle right here, you may hear it occasionally by its old name, the peroneus or peroneus longus muscle, but for us, fibularis longus on the lateral side, pinky toe, remember that's where the fibula lives. Then in the posterior compartment, the two easy or easier muscles, gastrocnemius and soleus, look at the division between the two muscles here, continuous with the calcaneal tendon. Right? If I rotate, I can still see them here because remember we don't really have a medial compartment. I've got gastrocnemius and soleus. Yeah, you should have heard, knew that squeak was coming by now. And if I remove the gastrocnemius and soleus, rotate this leg around, I can see right here, tibialis posterior. Just a little touch of it behind this nerve right here, tibialis posterior. But again, it's the only deep muscle in this posterior compartment. Can only see it when the gastrocnemius and soleus, that looks like a fish fillet, have been removed. Make sure that you watch this instructional video several times, draw your pictures, and when you're doing the practice for these muscles, pause, think about the actions, perform the actions with your joints, that will help you learn them, we hope, faster. Get ready, draw some pictures, then dive right into that practice. Hey everybody, look, Professor Allner's up on the table again. Well, yes I am. A, it's fun. B, it's kind of nice to see the room from up here this high. And C, it gives me a chance to explain something to you. That might be helpful in remembering this idea of compartments in the leg. So remember we have the anterior, lateral, and posterior compartments. And going forward you may hear, you may have already heard of a condition some people call shin splints or anterior compartment syndrome or tibial stress syndrome. These terms all get intermixed with one another it can be kind of confusing. Well, I do want to point one thing out to you. It isn't technically shin splints. I have heard more than one people say in my life, and I've heard people ask me about this idea. So here is a left tibia. There's one right here. There's one right here. This is a real one. If your tibia was actually splinting, coming apart, fragmenting, 
What do we call that? That's a fracture. We're not describing an injury that's a fracture of this major weight-bearing bone when somebody says shin splints or anterior compartment syndrome. We have as many compartment syndromes as we have muscular compartments. But when you look at this one, and you see this tibialis anterior riding right up against the tibia, and if you actually palpate your own, you'll notice there's not a lot of room in this compartment. And what we can get through a repetitive use injury, oftentimes, this dorsiflexing of the ankle caused by this muscle in, say, people who are running a lot. We can use this muscle. Now, as we use the muscle, it gets perfused with blood. It increases in volume. It applies pressure to the connective tissues. And we can have overuse of the tendons anchoring this muscle and the others in the compartment to the bones. So when we say anterior compartment syndrome, or tibial stress syndrome, or shin splints. We're often talking about inflammation of the connective tissue elements in this compartment, attaching these muscles to the bones. It can go away with a reduction in exercise because, of course, then the swelling gets reduced. So we're talking about tendonitis, we're talking about inflammation of the fascia or fascia, the connective tissues encapsulating the muscles in this compartment because there's not a lot of, let's say, volumetric room for things to expand here. Also, straight physical trauma could cause this. But many people think of it in terms of repetitive use, injuries, running, exercising, marching in the military, things like that. So your shin is not actually splinting. Duh, that would be a fracture. 